Tonight, Obama makes some very minor changes to NSA monitoring, scenes from the next big space race, and some nasty Android malware that you'll want to avoid. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 267 for Tuesday, February 3rd, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. Invest in yourself for 2015. lynda.com has thousands of courses to help you learn new tech, business, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-N-2. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get right to the tech feed. Nearly a year after President Obama officially called for changes to NSA data collection, the president finally announced a series of very modest updates today. According to the New York Times, the new safeguards will require U.S. intelligence analysts to delete private information they collect incidentally from non-citizens within five years. The announcement did not address electronic monitoring collection and storage of the private data of U.S. citizens. Privacy advocates were understandably critical of the announcement, saying that it does not go nearly far enough. Twitter's stock rose 6% today after the company announced an expansion to their promoted tweet program, plus new advertising partnerships with Yahoo Japan and newsreading mobile app Flipboard. Last month, we told you that Twitter planned to find a way to make money off of tweets no matter where you saw them, even if you don't even use Twitter. And now it looks like they found a way to do just that. We'll be following this story all this week and update you on how this news changes the outlook for Twitter as they announce their fourth quarter earnings on Thursday. And do you play the Android app game Durac? Well, maybe you shouldn't. According to antivirus software company Avast, Durac is riddled with adware that will cause pop-up windows that say your software is out of date. The worst part of this story is that 5 to 10 million people have already downloaded the app, and Duroc isn't, isn't the only popular app on Google Play that's infected. We're showing you now a video of what supposedly happens if you have the malware on your Google mobile device. So now, while this story was reported by PC Magazine, TechCrunch, and a few others, they all sourced their findings where I did, and that was the Avast antivirus blog, which recommends that you buy their product to avoid downloading apps with malicious software. So, of course, you can take their, adva their advice with a grain of salt, please. You've heard of the Google Lunar X Prize, the Google-sponsored competition to get to the moon. Tim Stevens, editor at large at CNET, has reported extensively on the competition, and we've invited him here to talk to, about, uh, to us about it today. Unfortunately, we've had some technical difficulties, so we're just going to see a still image of Tim and not uh, see his, him actually talking about what he's talking about. But welcome, Tim. Thanks very much. Sorry about the connection. We'll, we'll blame the snow. Yes, we will. So uh, you've reported extensively on the Google uh, Lunar X Prize done as it's been going on for the last couple of years. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is? Right. So Google has fronted the cash for a $30 million uh, competition to get independent teams to land on the moon. Uh, the $20 million grand prize that would be awarded to the first team that can land a rover or some kind of lander on the lunar surface, cover 500 meters either by driving a rover or even by taking off and hopping and landing 500 meters further away, and broadcasting back high-definition video back here to Earth. Uh, and the idea is that these are independent teams, they're not government-funded, you know, we're not talking about uh, U.S. versus Russia again or something like that. Um, and along the way, uh, to basically keep things going, because this competition has been going for a couple of years now, um, they created what's called the Milestone Challenges, which was basically an additional $6 million of funding to to help these teams along, and these challenges and these prizes would be awarded to the teams that could demonstrate that their landers work, that their rovers work, that their cameras work, and basically be incentives uh, to continue along the, the challenge. Five teams were uh, made eligible for these uh, these interim prizes, and I was lucky enough to go visit these five of teams last year as they went through their tests. So I went to the Mojave Desert and watched uh, Team Astrobotic testing a lander and flying that around in the desert, uh, went to uh, Japan to see the Japanese team testing the rovers and driving them around on the beach uh, and got to see a lot of pretty cool stuff, I must say. Wow. So they're independently funded. So they were just raising the money before they got these these interim prizes. Right. Yeah. So these teams have uh, been really looking around and kind of begging and scrapping 
with as much cash as they possibly can. In fact, all the teams that I spoke with, they said the number one challenge uh, in getting to the moon is not actually the engineering behind it, but it's actually getting the money to get get there. Uh, these teams are allowed to have up to 10% government funding, uh, but no more than that. Uh, so ultimately, we're talking tens of millions of dollars to get to the moon, uh, and they really need to find that independently. So did they do Kickstarter campaigns? or did they Are they corporate-backed? How are they finding this money? The, the, there's a huge range of funding here. We definitely did see some Kickstarter. Uh, the Japanese team, Hakuto, did some Kickstarter where they basically gave away uh, kind of small toy rovers to, to get some funding for themselves. Uh, but other teams uh, like Moon Express here in the U.S., that's actually a very well-funded uh, team. Basically, there's a lot of investors behind that team because they are looking for the long term. They want to get to the moon. They want to stay on the moon. And they want to do mining up there as well. So they're looking at this as basically a proof of concept for their technology to show that they can get to the moon. Uh, but that's really just going to be a first step for them. In 20 years, they want to be uh, mining liquid helium up uh, on the moon and basically creating rocket fuel up on the moon so they can and use that as a landing pad to go for further uh, further out in space, basically. It's pretty exciting stuff. So what's some of the most interesting technology that you saw that some of these teams are using? Well, the Japanese team that we visited uh, that's testing the rover, <clears throat> the, the requirement is for them to cover 500 meters, but they want to actually go beyond that. They have a second rover that's tied on a tether to their first rover. What they want to do is, is drive up to what's called a skylight, which is basically a lava tube on the moon and drop the second rover down into it basically on a bungee cord. The basic idea is that if they can prove that these lava tubes exist, and it's pretty well expected that they do, um, the idea is that you can create a human settlement in those lava tubes and it'd be much easier to move into one of those and to go to the moon and you know bring your entire house with you. You know, It's much easier to live, live in a cave than to, to build a house. So that's the idea. They want to drop that rover down in there on a cable, see what's going on inside that lava tube. And that's kind of a pretty exciting idea to think that we could all be watching a live stream from inside of a cave uh, on the moon. Um, that's what the Japanese team wants to do. And I, I'm pretty excited by that, uh, by that concept. Cool. Uh, so do you have a favorite or favorites? Oh, it's, it's pretty hard to, uh, to choose because there are a lot of exciting things going on. The, the, uh, the German team, part-time scientists, is a lot of volunteers, kind of a scrappy uh, startup team. Uh, the the Pittsburgh-based team, uh, Astro is based at Carnegie Mellon, and there's a lot of really excited students who are, you know, can you imagine how cool it would be to be a student at Carnegie Mellon and have your senior project be to build a rover that's going to be on the moon? <laughs> uh, so it's pretty exciting for them, too. And then uh, Team Moon Express, you know, the idea that we could be uh, mining on the moon in a few years is, uh, is a great concept, too. So uh, it's hard for me to pick a favorite for sure, uh, but they're all looking really promising. So when's the next, uh, when, when's the next level of the competition? <laughs> So at this point, the teams have until the end of 2016 to get to the moon, but uh, they have to have signed a launch contract by the end of this year. Uh, you, you know, you have to sign on with SpaceX or somebody like that to actually get your, your lander out into orbit, and then from there, they need to fly to the moon. Those contracts usually take at least 12 months to go, go through, so that's why Google's saying it had to be signed on with somebody by the end of this year. Uh, so we'll see a lot more testing through the course of 2015, uh, and then hopefully somebody will announce a launch launch partnership with SpaceX or with the Russian Space Agency or somebody else to get into orbit. Uh, and then by the end of 2016, hopefully somebody will be on the moon and they'll grab that uh, $20 million grand prize. And there are additional prizes as well for going out and surveying historic landing sites like one of the Apollo sites or covering extra distance. So we'll see if anybody can take in even more than $20 million. Well, cool. Thank you so much, Tim. If you want to watch Tim's video, you can watch that at CNET. Uh, what else are you working on, Tim? Uh, these days, doing a lot of automotive coverage, which is pretty exciting stuff, too. Uh, and soon we're going to be going out to the Geneva Motor Show, uh, which is at uh, the same time as MWC, actually. So we're going to be fighting for attention there. But a lot of great cars. Ferrari just unveiled the 488 uh, GTB, which will be at the Geneva Motor Show. So I'm looking forward to seeing that in the flesh. Well, thank you so much. That was Tim Stevens. He's editor-at-large at CNET. And coming up, Amazon plans brick-and-mortar stores, and a battle is brewing over a children's dictionary. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. It's already February. What are you waiting for? Invest in yourself this year and learn something new with a free 10-day trial to lynda.com. Lynda.com is used by millions of people around the world. It has over 4,500 courses on topics like web development, photography, visual design, and business, as well as software training like Excel, WordPress, and Photoshop. Do you want to sharpen your business skills to ask your boss for a raise? 
or make yourself more marketable to find a new job, I recommend lynda.com courses like Excel Tips and Tricks, Learning to Be Assertive, and the weekly Office Workshop series, which gives you a new Microsoft Office tip every Tuesday. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, each course is structured so you can learn at your own pace and on your own schedule from start to finish. And of course, all lynda.com courses are taught by experts who are accomplished professionals at the top of their field. So do something good for yourself in 2015 and sign up for a free 10-day trial to lynda.com by visiting lynda.com slash tn2. You'll get unlimited access to every course on lynda.com, including access on your iOS and Android devices, plus new courses as they're added each week. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash tn2 to try it free for 10 days. Go ahead. I challenge you to learn something new. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Yesterday, we told you that Radio Shack was filing for bankruptcy and was currently in talks with Sprint to buy half of their stores. Today, the news broke that Amazon is also in talks with Radio Shack to buy their stores to show off hardware and as a drop-off and pickup location for online customers. Yesterday, we also reported that Amazon inked a deal with major universities to sell their books and other wares. As of today, students at Purdue University will be able to pick up textbooks and return rented textbooks at a brick-and-mortar Amazon store on campus. Now, if the rumored deal with Radio Shack becomes a reality, you and I might both be able to browse an offline Amazon store soon. Yesterday, we also told you that the formerly chummy relationship between Uber and Google had hit the skids. Uber is reportedly moving into Google's territory by developing self-driving car technology, and Google is moving into Uber territory by developing a car-sharing app. Today, however, the Wall Street Journal reports that a person familiar with the matter said that Google's car-sharing app is just an app that a Google engineer is developing to help employees carpool to work. So we'll report on that if it is a rumor or true soon when we find out. British mobile chip maker Arm today unveiled a new processor core that the company claims triples performance over the current design. The chip is called the Arm Cortex A72. In addition to boosting power, the A72 also improves phone battery life by using 75% less power. Improvements come from better chip design and also a new 16 nanometer manufacturing process. In addition to the A72, ARM also rolled out two more flagship chip designs, one for graphics and another that handles system on a chip interconnectivity. ARM doesn't make chips. Instead, they license chip designs to companies like Qualcomm, Samsung, Apple, MediaTek, Rockchip, and NVIDIA. The new designs are available to chip makers starting today and should appear in next year's crop of smartphones. And finally, we bring you deep into the seamy underbelly of the world of children's dictionaries. According to the New Yorker magazine, there's a lexicographic kerfuffle happening that surrounds the magazine, what the magazine is calling our continuing plunge into the digital abyss. That's right. The Oxford Junior Dictionary, aimed at seven-year-olds, has removed words like acorn, almond, and minnow and replaced them with words like broadband, mp3 player and cut and paste because life moves on people and there's only so much room in the dictionary what do you think do you support this are you outraged we want to hear from you write to us at tn2 at twit.tv and if you like what we do here leave a review on itunes or stitcher or however you subscribe to the show you do subscribe to the show right if not go to twit.tv slash tn2 to subscribe and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m pacific And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.